Eastern this afternoon. The chamber will recess at about 6 o'clock for a White House congressional picnic, but are scheduled to return later on to resume work on transportation spending. Also, they'll consider several motions to instruct House negotiators working on agreements to the highway and mass transit programs bill. And now live to the House floor here on C-SPAN. The House will be in order. Prayer will be offered by our chaplain, Father Conway. Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for giving us another day. As the energy and tensions of the second session gather, may there be peace among the members of this people's house. Grant that all might be confident in the mission they have been given and buoyed by the spirit of our ancestors who built our republic through many trials and contentious debates. May all strive with noble sincerity for the betterment of our nation. Many centuries ago, you blessed Abraham for his welcome to strangers by the Oaks of Mamre. Bless this chamber this day with the same spirit of hospitality so that all Americans might know that in the people's house, all voices are respected, even those with whom there is disagreement. May all that is done be for your greater honor and glory. Amen. Amen. The chair has examined the journal of the last day's proceedings and announces to the House his approval thereof. Pursuant to Clause 1 of Rule 1, the journal stands approved. Pledge of Allegiance today will be led by the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Kaufman. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The chair will entertain up to 15 requests for one-minute speeches on each side of the aisle. For what purpose does the gentleman from South Carolina rise? Without objection, so ordered. Mr. Speaker, Americans will find out what we've been anxiously awaiting for the past two years, whether or not the government health care takeover bill is constitutional. Tomorrow at 10 a.m., People across the nation will be closely watching and listening as the Supreme Court delivers its opinion. In the efforts to rally her party for Obamacare, former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi outraged Americans at a press conference by stating, quote, we have to pass the bill so we can find out what's in it, end of quote. The American people now know this bill, and they overwhelmingly disapprove of, it, of this bill, which the National Federation of Independent Business reveals will destroy 1.6 million jobs. It is my hope the Supreme Court will set aside with the best interests of, of the American people and overturn the job-destroying, out-of-control spending and overreaching government health care takeover bill, which will hurt senior citizens with waiting lists, rationing, and denial of service. In conclusion, God bless our troops, and we'll never forget September 11th and the global war on terrorism. Congratulations, Tom Rice of Myrtle Beach. The gentleman uh, yields back the balance of his time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Virginia seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Tomorrow, we risk bringing dishonor to this House. For members who revere Congress as the legislative branch of government, the majority's irresponsible and unprecedented contempt vote is just another sad chapter in our recent institutional decline. I implore my colleagues to give careful consideration as to whether we truly want the 112th Congress to become the first in history to hold a sitting cabinet member in contempt of Congress. Do we really want our legacy to be establishing one of the most partisan House of Representatives of all time, so clouded in judgment, so besotted with rancor and partisanship that we're incapable of addressing vital separation of powers conflicts in a serious and fair fashion. Further negotiations with the Department of Justice and the Attorney General are clearly available if we want a solution. I urge my colleagues to join me in restoring honor and dignity to this House by opposing the nuclear option, a contempt citation. 
I yield back. Time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Colorado seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. An important part of the continued viability of our nation's small businesses is their access to capital. To foster this access, we need to provide community financial institutions with responsible regulatory relief so they can increase lending to small businesses. That is why today I've introduced the Small Business Lending for Jobs Act of 2012. This bipartisan legislation will allow community banks to spread losses in commercial real estate over a seven-year period. This will allow banks to retain more capital and use these funds to make new loans to small businesses in their communities. The bill also establishes a dual mission for federal banking regulators and the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, mandating these entities promote credit availability so long as credit as that credit is provided in a safe and sound manner. This will bring a greater balance to banking regulations. A dual mission will lead to regulators factoring in the impact on banks, communities, and customers in making their decision. I urge my colleagues to support the Bipartisan Small Business Lending for Jobs Act of 2012. Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Rhode Island seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Madam Speaker, I rise today to recognize the work being done in my home state of Rhode Island as we host the final leg of the inaugural America's Cup World Series, an incredible boost to our tourism economy and a great moment for our state. Teams of competitors and spectators from around the world have come to Newport for the America's Cup World Series, which according to some estimates is expected to bring in $70 million for our state's economy. Although Newport hosted the America's Cup from 1930 through 1983, this marks the first time in history that America's Cup races are actually being held inside Narragansett Bay. The opportunity to host the leg of this year's America's Cup not only provides a source of real economic benefit for my state, but also an intangible level of pride for all Rhode Islanders. Thank you to the organizers for their hard work. I wish the competitors good luck. And to all those likely to benefit from the enormous economic impact of these events, much success. Thank you, and I yield the back to The gentleman to yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Arkansas seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to honor the members of the Mountain Home High School first robotics team known as the Baxter Bomb Squad, who recently won the annual For Inspiration and Recognition of Science and Technology Championship. The team was made up of 22 students and 14 adults, including several pairs of father and son teams. Together, they spent hundreds of hours building a robot which competed in the Rebound Rumble, a basketball-inspired game. The team competed in front of an audience of 30,000 people and against more than 400 other teams. The Baxter Bomb Squad has been competing for 17 years, and for the very first time this year, they won the championship. They were sponsored by local businesses, including Baxter Baxter Healthcare and Mountain Home High School. The For Inspiration and Recognition of Science and Technology Championship has helped influence thousands of students throughout the country to pursue higher education in engineering and related science fields. Students who participated in this competition are 50 percent more likely to attend college and twice as likely to major in science and engineering. Congratulations to the Baxter Bomb Squad. Best of luck for years to come. Yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the uh, gentleman from New York seek recognition? without objection. Mr. Speaker, every day more and more ca cancer patients across the country are denied coverage for smart drugs because insurance companies refuse to cover them. A uh, resident in my district uh, called my office last month to say that her insurance company refused to cover oral chemotherapy drug. Uh, she was prescribed to fight her cancer because her policy uh, covered only generic drugs. Mr. Speaker, uh, the insurance paradigm has not kept pace with the science, and this is unacceptable. Uh, I, that's why I've introduced H.R. 2746, the Cancer Drug Coverage Parity Act, to mandate parity and coverage for all forms of chemotherapy, whether they're administered orally or through the vein. I urge my colleagues to support this legislation because cancer treatment should be determined by a physician and not by arbitrary and outdated insurance policies. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does a gentleman from Georgia seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Thanks, Madam Speaker.
Madam Speaker, more than two years ago, the President signed into law one of the most egregious attacks upon our freedom that this nation has ever seen. Two years later, almost 60 percent of the American people still want to see Obamacare repealed before the price of their health care goes up even more than it already has. Believe me, if we let this law take effect as planned, cost will skyrocket and millions of Americans will lose their insurance altogether. On top of restrictive mandates, higher taxes, Medicare cuts, and more government overreach, Obamacare is flat out unconstitutional. We simply cannot force the American people to buy health insurance if they don't want it. I'm hopeful that tomorrow the Supreme Court will do its job and apply the Constitution as our Founding Fathers intended. I look forward to repealing Obamacare and getting started on real health care reform as soon as the court reaches a decision. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentlelady from New York seek recognition? Without objection, the gentlelady is recognized. Ma Madam Speaker, with, with so few days left in this legislative session, this is a time when we could be talking about how to help create jobs, improve education, lower the deficit. That is surely what the American people really care about. Instead, the greatest deliberative body in the world is quarreling about bringing a contempt charge to the floor of Congress against the Attorney General. It has never happened before. And let's be clear, it's not about finding the truth or creating reforms or finding out how gun walking started. We know how that started. It started under the Bush administration. What this is about is just the Republican leadership pursuing single-mindedly a political vendetta, a political obsession. Like Ahab going after the great white whale, they are hoping to spill political blood. This is the type of gamemanship and partisanship that understandably makes the American people lose faith in their Congress and in their leaders. So tomorrow, if it comes to the floor, vote no. Let's expired. get back to work on the real problems. The gentlelady's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Tennessee seek recognition? Address the House for one minute. Without uh, objection, the gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Tomorrow, the House is intending to vote on a contempt of our outstanding Attorney General, Eric Holder. It's because the Republicans have been obsessed with Fast and Furious. Fast and Furious was a plan that went awry. It started by the Bush administration and went awry. It was fatally flawed and it resulted in the tragic death of a border agent. But nothing in this resolution will get to the bottom of it and nothing will change it. The fact is Fast and Furious is misnamed. Fast and Furious is which the Republicans, starting with Senator Mitch McConnell, have been doing since President Obama was elected. In a fast and furious way, they have tried to do everything they can to taint the President of the United States and to taint anybody associated with him. And that's what they're out with Eric Holder. They want to blemish him and blemish the President. Their fast and furious attack on the health care bill, which will save lives in America, and on this administration, is shameless. We should be creating jobs, helping the middle class, and putting America on the road to recovery. Instead, what we've been doing is a fast and furious attack on this administration. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentlelady from the Virgin Islands seek recognition? To adjust the House for one minute. Without objection, the so gentlelady is recognized. The next stand. Thank you, Madam Speaker. While we decry bullying in our schools, unfortunately, it's going on right here in this House. Tomorrow, the ISSA resolution will holding our Attorney General in contempt is to come to the floor, and I urge my colleagues to put an end to this totally politically inspired attack on Attorney General Holder and President Obama's administration. Thousands of documents have been produced. Many interviews have been held, and Mr. Holder has testified before Congress nine times on the Operation Fast and Furious, which was started in Arizona, no less, and under President Bush's administration. Democrats were not allowed one witness 
or a hearing that would have made this a fair, balanced, and likely closed investigation. At the en end of this extreme, unprecedented partisan attack on the current administration, which is what it's all about, and what can only be called a political witch hunt, what you will find in Attorney General Eric Holder is an intelligent, competent, patriotic, dedicated, and humble public servant who is upholding the integrity of his office and serving this country with our honor. Madam Speaker, I urge the House not to sully the history and decorum of this body with this first ever vote to hold a sitting Attorney General in contempt. And the gentlelady's time the has expired. Time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Missouri seek recognition? Address the House for one minute. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Madam Speaker, tomorrow this House is about to do something unprecedented and unwarranted, motivated solely by politics. The leadership of this House are planning to smear a dedicated public servant. For the first time in our history, they are planning to hold the Attorney General of the United States in contempt of Congress. This is shameful, not even during the nakedly partisan speakership of Newt Gingrich has this House even considered such a resolution. But even more shameful is that they are ignoring the real issue the easily available assault weapons and the gun-related violence that continues unabated in this country. Madam Speaker, they need to put aside politics and start caring about the safety of all of our citizens. And I yield back. The gentleman Madam yields Speaker. back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Connecticut seek recognition? Yes, to address that for one minute. Without Rise objection, the, the gentleman is recognized. Madam Speaker, I live in the village of Coscob, Connecticut where years ago a major bridge spanning the Mianus Harbor on Route 95 fell into the Mianus Harbor, killing a number of people, devastating the quality of life in the area, and hurting businesses up and down the coastline. It fell into Mianus Harbor because we failed to invest in our transportation infrastructure. We failed to do something that we all understand is critical to our economy and just plain good sense. On June 30th, thousands of projects like keeping the Mianus Harbor Bridge intact will come to a halt because this House will not approve a reauthorization of the transportation belt. That's bad economics. It's bad for jobs and it's bad for safety. So what do we do? 74 senators, lots of Republicans and lots of Democrats, passed a two-year bill that would keep the funding going and preserve or save or create two million jobs. But not in this House. No, in this House, We've got to get the president to approve Keystone. Now, we should do that, but let's do it separately and invest in jobs and our infrastructure. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield back the balance. The gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Hawaii seek recognition? Without objection, the gentlelady is recognized. Madam Speaker, tomorrow the United States Supreme Court is expected to rule on the constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act. Let us all step back and recognize those portions that people like. These are the highlights. For seniors, it closes an infamous donut hole for prescription drugs. This means, to date, about 5.3 million seniors have experienced a savings of $3.7 billion. That donut hole will close completely by the year 2010, 2020. For women, we're no longer going to suffer the discrimination against us. 90% of the plans today today charge more for women than they do for men for the same process. 2014, this stops. Women can no longer be discriminated against for what they call pre-existing conditions. And you know what these pre-existing conditions are? Breast cancer, C-section and childbirth, pregnancy, victims of domestic abuse. And there'll be a ban on maximum coverage in your lifetime for medical care. And you no longer need to have a referral to go see an OBGYN. Children will also benefit. Madam Speaker, let's all recognize the value of the Affordable Care Act. Thank you. you the back. gentlelady's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentlelady from California yeah. seek recognition? Without objection, the gentlelady is recognized. Thank you. Madam Speaker, if you know you're approaching a cliff, wouldn't you take steps to avoid it? Consumer confidence is flagging. It's flagging in part because some members of the House have taken to brandishing the debt ceiling as a weapon designed to undercut economic growth. Well, that just isn't responsible. 
We have to put our heads together. We have to put our heads together now to find a responsible way to cut spending and increase revenues rather than play the blame game. We cannot allow this year's approaching fiscal crisis to go the way of the Budget Super Committee. That means both parties must find common ground. I know that's what San Diegans expect. It is critical that we deal with our real problems. Those who are underemployed need jobs. Doctors facing reimbursement cuts must be paid, and everything cannot be paid for on the backs of the middle class. I yield back. The gentlelady yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from California seek recognition? Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Madam Speaker, it's my honor today to welcome to the House of Representatives His Holiness Hazrat Mirza Masroor Ahmad. He is with us today in the gallery. His Holiness is the worldwide spiritual leader of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community which has tens of millions of adherents around the world in 190 countries and tens of thousands of adherents here in the United States. Today at a historic event in the uh, Gold Room in the Rayburn Building, we recognized His Holiness's commitment to world peace, to brotherhood, to justice, and to religious freedom. I'm proud to join with our colleagues Olafgren and others in introducing a resolution today in honor of His Holiness's visit here to our nation's capital. In the United States, the uh, Ahmadi community is one of the oldest and most organized Islamic communities. I also want to take this opportunity to, to recognize two distinguished leaders uh, from Los Angeles, Dr. Asaf uh, Mahmoud and Kareem Ahmad, uh, who are also in the gallery here and who uh, show such leadership of the Muslim community in the Los Angeles area. It is my uh, honor to uh, recognize His Holiness, to invite him to be with us here in the People's House. And uh, I want to commend the Ahmadi uh, motto, love for all, hatred for none. Thank you, Ms. Uh, the gentleman's Madam time has expired. The chair will remind all persons in the gallery that they are here as guests of the House and that any manifestations of approval or disapproval of proceedings is in violation of the rules of the House. For what purpose does the gentleman from Michigan seek recognition? Madam Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to address the House for one minute. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Madam Speaker, and to the American people, to the over one million online supporters of my legislation to forgive student loans, I want to thank you all for creating a national movement, a movement so strong that we are now demanding that this House and this Congress do something to cap student loan interest rates. But we can't give up. We can't stop there. We've got to cut this debt to bring people hope and to create jobs. And I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. For what purpose does the gentleman from California seek Madam recognition? Consent to, uh, Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Every year, California dairies produce over 17 million pounds of milk products that provide families with affordable, nutrient-rich products that we consume. California is the nation's top milk producing state and much of the production takes place in the San Joaquin Valley that I represent a part of. Many of these dairies in my district have been passed down from generation to generation, including the one that I grew up on in Kearney Park near Fresno, California. Over the last few years, dairy producers have seen milk uh, prices continue to drop and feed prices increase and even skyrocket. In the coming weeks, the Ag Committee is slated to begin the consideration of the 2012 Farm Bill. It is my hope that we can find a way to, prevent the more, to bring more certainty in prices and prevent extreme market volatility to help our producers throughout the country stay afloat. As the National Dairy Month comes to a close, I'd like to commend our dairy men and women for the work they do every day on the farm, 365 days a year, that allows families nationwide 
to enjoy the nutritious food that we, they are putting on our tables, which is cost effective. I yield back the balance of the my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. For what purpose does the gentleman from New York seek recognition? The House for one minute, Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Madam Speaker, several weeks ago, my friend from New York, uh, Congressman Hanna, and I sent a bipartisan letter to the International Olympic Committee asking them to hold a moment of silence during the opening ceremonies of this year's Olympic Games in commemoration of the victims of the 1972 Munich Massacre. September 5, 1972, two weeks after the start of the Olympic Games in Munich, members of a Palestinian terrorist group, Black September, broke into the Olympic Village. Eleven Israelis were killed in that massacre. Now, 40 years later in London, we are convening another Olympic ceremony. And we asked the International Olympic Committee to recognize this 40-year anniversary. And the response we got was no. That is the wrong response, Madam Speaker. We again, on a bipartisan basis, appeal to the International Olympic Committee in London, when these Olympics begin, commemorate those Israelis who were massacred, which fits the ideals of the Olympics, and that is international friendship and fraternity. Eleven lives were lost. We should remember them in London when the Olympics convene. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentlelady from Florida seek recognition? Without objection, the gentlelady is recognized. Madam Speaker, today I rise to draw attention to the fact that there are only four days left until federal student loan interest rates double. On July 1st, the interest rate for 7 million students could rise to 6.8 percent. Failure to act and to act now would add $6.3 billion to students' debts, burdens in one year alone. Frankly, Madam Speaker, this rise in rates would happen at a time when our young people can least afford it. Our young people who are recent college graduates have the highest unemployment rate of any age group in the nation, and more of them are graduating with debt than ever before. In fact, two-thirds of the class of 2010 graduated with student loan debt. Madam Speaker, this is a real problem. It should be solved now, and it shouldn't be solved on the backs of the working class and the poor. I urge my colleagues to join me and do the right thing. Let's stop the interest rate from doubling before it's too late. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlelady's time has expired. If there are no further one-minute uh, speeches, pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, the unfinished business is the question on suspending the rules and passing H.R. 4018 as amended, which the clerk will report by title. H.R. 4018, a bill to improve the Public Safety Officers Benefits Program. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and pass the bill as amended? As many as are in favor, say aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended, the bill is passed, and without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid on the table. Purpose, does the gentleman from Iowa rise? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that all members may have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks and ex include extraneous material in H.R. 5972 and that I may include tabular material on the same. Without objection. Pursuant to House Resolution 697 and Rule 18, the Chair declares the House and the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for the further consideration of H.R. 5972. Would the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Roslatinen, kindly take the Chair. The House is in the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for the further consideration of H.R. 5972, which the clerk will report by title. A bill making appropriations for the Departments of Transportation and Housing and Urban Development and related agencies for the fiscal year ending September 30, 2013, and for other purposes. 
When the Committee of the Whole rose on Tuesday, June 26, 2012, Amendment No. 1 printed in the Congressional Record, offered by the gentleman from New York, Mr. Nadler, had been disposed of and the bill had been read through page 74, line 6. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized for an amendment. Madam Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Brown of Georgia, page 74, line 6, after the dollar amount insert reduced the by $6,500,000. The gentleman is recognized to explain his amendment. Thank you, Madam Chairman. My amendment would reduce the proposed funding for the salaries and expenses of the Office of Public and Indian Housing by $6,500,000. This is one of 13 offices which would receive increases for administrative expenses in the underlying bill. Madam Chairman, we're in an economic emergency as a nation. We're broke. We absolutely must stop spending money that we don't have. We're borrowing 40 cents or more on every dollar that the federal government expends. Raising the funding for the Office of Public and Indian Housing by six and a half million dollars while we're broke makes no fiscal sense to me. This particular increase is among the highest for all the offices funded under this legislation. My amendment would simply freeze funding for this office for this next year. Passage of my amendment would bring this account back to this year's FY 2012 levels. I urge support of my amendment and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the uh, gentleman from Iowa speak? Uh, I would uh, move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. Uh, Madam Chairman, I uh, rise to oppose the gentleman's amendment. It's a good talking point, reducing administration <coughs> accounts that uh, received increases. We've scrubbed these accounts, we've held hearings, asked questions, and made recommendations about what should be funded rather than looking at an arbitrary number. Uh, the bill cuts $4 billion from fiscal year 2012, uh, which is a fiscally responsible level and uh, I would urge a no vote, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Massachusetts seek recognition? I move to strike the last the word The gentleman is recognized. Well. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman. The, um, the, amendment, the amendment that has been offered uh, uh, removes a 3% increase in the administrative account for the Office of Public and Indian Housing. Um, and I rise to uh, oppose the amendment. In this instance, the uh, cuts in the Office of Public and Indian Housing covers a, lot, a number of things, including the VASH program. We're adding $75 million for additional VASH vouchers, uh, veterans homelessness vouchers, and um, that has to be administered. Uh, the, admi the, uh, the arbitrary six and a half million dollars simply does not help with that effort. If it hurts that effort, the uh, office also implements the operating and capital funds for public housing. Uh, and the Native American housing grants, which uh, are those up to or not? And uh, and the uh, all of these require either layoffs, removals of people because the uh, uh, salaries and expenses of the office. Uh, uh, are subject to normal increases, the small increases year by year for salaries for people in those places, and they are clearly going to end up having to reduce the number of personnel uh, while they're administrating, administering more 
and particularly the housing and, and the homeless uh, program for veterans. So on that basis, I think this is a, an unwise reduction and, uh, and one that is unjustified as well as unwise. And, uh, and I would urge a no vote on the amendment. And I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Georgia. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. No. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed Madam to. Chair. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized. I request a recorded vote. A recorded vote uh, is uh, re uh, requested pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18. Further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Georgia will be postponed. Purpose. The clerk will first read. Page 74, line 7, Community Planning and Development, $103,500,000. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized. Madam Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Brown of Georgia, page 74, line 9, after the dollar amount, insert reduced by $3,500,000. Page 150, line 9, after the dollar amount, insert increased by $3,500,000. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized to explain his amendment. Thank you, Madam Chairman. My amendment would reduce the proposed funding for salaries and expenses for the Office of Community Planning and Development by $3,500,000. This amendment, like the ones I presented last night and the one I just presented, would freeze the funding for these offices. I've heard my good friend from Iowa and my good, friend, good friends on the other side talk about how the underlying bill has cut expenses for this whole underlying bill. But here in the House of Representatives, we've reduced our expenses by over 11 percent. And it seems to me that it just makes fiscal sense to freeze funding for these offices in the underlying bill and not raise them. We're in an economic emergency as a, ma as a nation. We are spending money that we simply do not have. We've got to stop the outrageous spending that's going on here in Washington. And I'm just asking a simple thing. Let's freeze all these offices at current year's levels for one more year. Hopefully next year we'll have policy put in place that will increase our economy and start creating jobs here in this nation. But we're not doing that this year with this administration and the policies that we see in the other body on the other side of the hill. So let's just freeze the expenses of this office, and I'm proposing to freeze the expenses of virtually all the offices in this bill, most of them anyway. And my amendment would bring the spending level that's proposed back to the current spending level of 2012, when families and businesses get overextended, they don't continue to raise their spending levels, and we should not be raising this one either. My amendment would just freeze it at the current spending levels. I urge support of my amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. For what purpose does the gentleman from Massachusetts rise? Uh, I rise to, to uh, claim time in opposition to the, the gentleman is amendment. Recognized. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, this amendment, again, is, a, as the gentleman has said, an amendment that would freeze at the level of the 2012 um, funding here for salaries and expenses of the Office of Community Planning and Development. Now, this office, it turns out uh, admin administers and implements the CDBG program, which, which in the bill as presented by my chairman uh, is increased substantially, substantially, 
several hundred million dollars in the uh, CDBG program and uh, increases the funding for the home program which had been uh, which had been held at a much lower level in the last year's program in both of those cases they were considerably lower and just last night we added an amendment to increase the uh, the funding for the HAPWA the uh, housing for persons with AIDS one of those vulnerable populations that we have and that uh, our uh, housing programs as with veterans who are homeless others who are homeless uh, those who are uh, vulnerable as with uh, living with AIDS and uh, these have proven to be rather strong um, strong programs that have strong support. Furthermore, there are already across the board in HUD, there has been a reduction in, in, um, in personnel services and in the uh, uh, salaries and expenses of $20 million already compared with last year's overall within the Department of, uh, of HUD. So this is a duplicate and hitting at vulnerable populations that uh, that we do not want to or should not want to be reducing and the, the reduction again requires that there be some uh, some reduction in personnel because people's salaries go up they go up because people get a COLA or a, uh, a cost of living increase of some sort uh, with their salaries or they move up in in their category within the because of longevity so it ends up putting people who have jobs out of work and reducing the personnel to provide service to the American people uh, and slows down the work of the offices in all these places where we I think all have a stake in making certain that they are efficiently implemented. So I would uh, urge a no vote on the amendment and, uh, and uh, I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. For what purpose is the gentleman from I Iowa seek recognition? Strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. I, I thank the, uh, the Madam Chairman and uh, I just rise in opposition to the amendment. Uh, you know, we went through all the hearing process. We have worked on these numbers to try and, number one, to stay within our allocation, which we have done. We're actually cutting $4 billion in this bill. But also to prioritize. There's no one more sensitive about hardworking taxpayer dollars than I am. Uh, but the fact of the matter is this is an absolute critical function. Uh, the increase that is here is extremely important so that these programs can be carried out properly without waste, fraud, and abuse. And uh, for that reason, I would uh, uh, again urge a no vote on this amendment. The gentleman yield yields back. back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Georgia. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed Madam to. Chair. For what purpose does the gentleman seek recognition? I request a recorded vote on this amendment. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Georgia will be postponed. The clerk will read. Page 74, line 10, housing, $396,500,000. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized. Madam Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Brown of Georgia, page 74, line 12, after the first dollar amount, insert reduced by $5 million. Page 150, line 9, after the dollar amount, insert increased by $5 million. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized to explain his amendment. Thank you, Madam Chairman. My amendment, again, would reduce the proposed fundings for salaries and expenses of bureaucrats here in Washington for the House Office of Housing by $5 million. That's 
Absolutely correct. This amendment, as well as all of my amendments, will not cut the programs. Will not cut the programs one iota. What this does is it reduces the salaries. I just heard my good friend from Massachusetts talking about federal bureaucrats getting raises. I have frozen the salaries of people who work for me, and I know many members of Congress have, for the last two years. Why should we be giving federal bureaucrats more money when the American people are not getting raises? It makes no sense to me, particularly as we are in an economic emergency. We're spending money we don't have. We've got to stop the outrageous spending that's going on here in Washington. Enough is enough. And raising this office, as well as all these offices above the 2012 level, makes no economic sense to me whatsoever. Let's be fiscally responsible. My good friend from Iowa, who I have the utmost respect for, for, has done a tremendous job in this bill. And I do appreciate the tremendous hard work that he and his committee has done. And I appreciate the $4 billion that they've cut. But why raise the salaries of federal bureaucrats? My amendment would simply reduce the proposed funding back to the 2012 levels. And I already support my amendment, and I yield back the balance. The gentleman of the yields back. For what purpose is a gentleman from Iowa seeking? Strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. I thank the uh, Madam Chairman. Uh, I again rise in opposition to the gentleman's amendment. I think there's some factors that we need to take into consideration. Uh, for one thing, next year, fiscal year, we have an additional uh, compensable day which has to be paid for. We have GSA that has raised rents. Uh, we have already cut $14 million out of salaries and expenses, uh, so we would not be able to meet our requirements. We are not giving federal employees raises, but there are additional costs that come into play because of rents, because of the additional day uh, that our federal workers will be working next year. And uh, for those reasons, and again, I want to reiterate we have cut $14 million out of this account, uh, and I would just urge a no vote. The gentleman I yields back. back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Massachusetts seek recognition? I move to strike the last word. The gentleman is recognized. In this instance, it is again a case of, of freezing a, um, a salary and expenses account at the uh, previous year's level. Um, but this one has an interesting sidelight in that in the legislation that we have before us, we have uh, adopted a presidential recommendation for a partial year funding for project-based project Section 8 vouchers, which is going to cause considerable additional uh, uh, administration than the usual program, and not always, but the usual program of doing full year uh, continuation of, of those voucher programs. There's going to be much uncertainty if this goes on all the way uh, in ado to, do, to adoption. And uh, there would be much uncertainty for the people who are the owners uh, and providers of that housing, and probably some loss in actual affordable housing uh, available under the project based section 8 program so the this is a case where they need that assistance this is where the uh, where we administer the uh, the housing programs for elder elderly and disabled the so-called 202 programs and uh, and 811 chapters 202 and chapter 811 programs for elderly and disabled people, as well as the housing uh, uh, counseling assistance. And in addition, we have the Federal Housing Administration, which is having much larger level of activity as we're trying to dig out of the foreclosure crisis in the past, and um, from the past, and that agency needs 
to uh, needs to have personnel that are qualified and able to do the right job. So again here, and I, by the way, I made an error in my per previous comments the, when I said there was a reduction across the, the board for HUD. What I should have uh, indicated was that it was a reduction in the salary and, and expenses account over a period of time going back to 2010 of $20 million across, across that, um, pro the programs of uh, 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 salaries and expenses within HUD over that time. So I made a mistake saying it was a $20 million reduction in, the, in one year. But for all those reasons, um, I urge a no vote on the amendment and uh, yield back. The, the gentleman yields my time. back the balance of his time. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Georgia. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed Madam to. Madam Chairman. Gentleman from Georgia. I ask for a recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Georgia will be postponed. The clerk will read. Page 74, line 14. Policy Development and Research, $22,326,000. For what purpose does the gentleman from Georgia seek recognition? Madam Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Brown of Georgia, page 74, line 16, after the dollar amount insert reduced by $115,000. Page 150, line 9, after the dollar amount insert increased by $115,000. The gentleman from Georgia is recognized. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Again, I rise to propose amendment to just freeze the salaries and expenses of this Office of Public uh, of Policy Development and Research by a mere $115,000. Madam Chairman, I hear colleagues around here talking as if millions of dollars, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars is nothing. Well, most of my constituents at home in Georgia, most of the Americans think that a million dollars is a lot of money. And I certainly think a million dollars is a lot of money. But we have proposed in this underlying bill to raise the administrative expenses and salaries. My good friend from Massachusetts in the previous amendment said we need to increase the salaries of the bureaucrats. And I hope my good friend from Iowa, Mr. Latham, when he stood up on the last amendment saying that we weren't going to increase salaries of federal bureaucrats um, is factual. And I hope that they goes in the record and it becomes true that we're not going to raise the salaries of federal bureaucrats. But they're proposing raising the administrative expenses and salaries in all of these offices. And so I'm proposing just to freeze these expenses for one more year. Let's bring this account back down to this current year's levels of spending. We cannot continue on this road. Madam Chairman, I'm a medical doctor, and as a medical doctor, part of my medical practice for many years has been involved in treating addictions, drug and alcohol addictions. And in addiction medicine, we have a saying, when there's no denial, there's no addiction. Congress and government have a spending addiction. It's a spending addiction, and there's a tremendous amount of denial here in this city in all branches of government, actually. We need to face the fact. We're broke as a nation. We've got to stop the outrageous spending. And I'm proposing just a mere $115,000 to freeze the expenses for this office and salaries for this office for one more year. I don't think that's too much for me to ask. I don't think that's too much for the American taxpayer, the hardworking American taxpayer to ask for us to freeze the salaries of these bureaucrats here in Washington and freeze their expenses for one more year, not only for this amendment, but for the amendments that I've, I've uh, already pre presented and the ones that I will present. Let's freeze this spending for one more year, keep it at the FY 2012 levels, 
I urge support of my amendment, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. For what purpose does the gentleman from Massachusetts seek recognition? Madam uh, Chairperson, I, uh, uh, is I rise to strike the last word. I guess that's, that'll be enough. Um, the gentleman from Georgia just wants to freeze everything. But our personnel in an agency like this, they are subject to the civil service laws, to the uh, personnel laws under OPM, and, and they are assigned in grades and then steps. And they have several steps as, as, they, uh, as they gain seniority and go from step one to step seven, and then they may sit for a while. But you end up with people, if you, unless you're really trying to put people out of work, unless you're trying to pe put people out of work, and there is no reason to do that for this kind of an agency, at all, um, then there has to be a slow, small increase for those people who move from step to step along the salary uh, scale. And so, and so this is an amendment that, uh, that simply caused disruption in the, in the processing and in the uh, personnel systems for the agency which has lots of work to do. We should be worrying about how to get, uh, uh, how to get productivity in, in the uh, processing rather than about trying to jigger and freeze a step system uh, pay scale for, uh, the, the, for the people who are under, the, uh, who are the, um, the, the people who do the work at this agency, and I, uh, I again urge that this ad uh, amendment not be adopted and uh, reserve the balance, uh, return the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of uh, his time. The question is on the amendment, uh, oh sorry, for what purpose does the gentleman from New York <coughs> seek recognition? I move to strike the last word. The gentleman please. is recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I rise to, to disagree with the rhetoric and the mythology uh, propounded here by the gentleman from Georgia. And the mythology is that we have a tremendous spending binge that we must reduce, that the country is broke, and it's broke because we're spending much too much money, and we've got to reduce the spending. It's simply not true. Eleven years ago, or 12 years ago, in 2000, we were looking at a $5.6 trillion surplus over the next 10 years. Uh, the, the chairman of the uh, Federal Reserve Board, Alan Greenspan, in testifying in favor of President Bush's tax reductions, said we have to reduce taxes because if we don't, we will pay off the entire national debt by 2012. And that would be a bad thing for some reason, which I won't go into now. He thought it would be a bad thing if we paid off the entire national debt. How did we change? And the entire debate between the two candidates, uh, Bush and Gore, then was what should we do with this $5.6 trillion surplus? How did we change from a $5.6 trillion surplus to the budget deficits we have now? Not by increasing spending. If you look at the spending amount other than military, if you look at the discretionary spending of the federal government other than military, adjusted for inflation, and population growth, it has not increased by a nickel since 2001. Not by a nickel. What has changed? What has changed to create the deficit? Because if you want to solve the deficit, you have to know what created it to undo it. What has changed to create the deficit is several things. One, 40% of the deficit is caused by the Bush tax cuts, which will expire in de uh, at the end of the year unless we change that. 40% of the current and anticipated deficits were caused by the Bush tax cuts of 2001 and 2003. Second, two unfunded wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. The first time in American history we fought major wars without increasing taxes to pay for them. Third, aside from the wars, completely aside from the wars, we have doubled Pentagon spending since 2001 in real terms. And finally, we have a depression or a recession. 
when you have a recession that started in 2007 or 8, tax receipts go down, expenses on things like food stamps and unemployment insurance goes up, and that's when you should run a deficit. You should run a surplus in good times. You should run a deficit during a depression or recession in order to stimulate the economy and, getting it, and get it back up. If we want to deal with the deficit, and we should deal with the deficit, we shouldn't reduce necessary government spending and certainly not nickel and dime uh, uh, step pay increases for federal employees. If we want to reduce the deficit, we should undo most of the Bush tax cuts for the rich because most of the Bush taxes went to rich people and to very large corporations. We are only collecting about 14 or 15 percent of GDP in taxes this year. The normal ranges between 20, 19 and 21 percent, and I say normal meaning the entire post-World War II period ranges between 18 or 19 and 22 percent. We're collecting 14 or 15 percent in the last couple of years because, of one, the recession, and two, because we greatly reduced effective taxes on multinational corporations and on rich people. We used to have in this country, under President Reagan, we had 25 different tax brackets. Someone making $5 million paid a higher tax, than, a higher tax rate than someone making $1 million, who paid a higher tax rate than someone making 250 and so forth. Now, the highest tax rate kicks in at below $250,000. And someone making $250 million pays no higher tax rate than someone making $175 or $200,000. There's something very wrong with that. So if we want to deal with the deficit, deal not with the non-existent problem, which is the huge non-existent spending surge that didn't occur, and we have great needs in this country. We have to fix our highways, our roads, our bridges, our hospitals, our broadband. We have to invest so this country will be economically competitive. And our schools and our teachers and our high cops and our, all of these things. If you want to fix the deficit, don't shortchange what we should be doing to invest in this country. Get rid of the Bush tax cuts, or most of them, which went entirely, or get rid of those portions of the Bush taxes that went to rich people, high-income people, and to big corporations. Make corporations, the large corporations, pay an effective tax rate again, instead of ha a large number of our top corporations pay spending, paying zero dollars in taxes. Reduce the Pentagon budget, which we can do. We, should, we, we no longer need all those troops in Germany to protect against a Soviet tank invasion, which is not likely to occur since the Soviets don't exist anymore. That's what we ought to be doing. But the key thing is, don't have this mythology that we have a greatly expanded federal spending over the last 10 years, which, or even over the last three years, which is simply not the case. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Georgia. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those in favor, those opposed say no.